Thanks for having me, guys. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk about Agile customer um, experience design. Um, and I've given this talk a couple times before. Um, so this is probably version 2.04. <laughs> um, yeah, so Deloitte and Touche have found that uh, customer-centric companies are about 60% more profitable compared to companies that are not focused on the customer. So having a strong company-wide customer focus is more important than just being agile alone to create high-performance design. So today we're going to talk about how to keep the customer needs, emotions, and behaviors at the center of every design decision to generate the most value. So harvesting insights from feedback and driving them back into the customer experience with speed at scale is really what makes a company both innovative and agile. Um, embodying design thinking and growth mindset are key to achieving this. So let me just also preface this, like I'm not sure exactly what kind of company is everybody is um, from who's on this call, but I've definitely given this talk at a lot of different organizations. And um, I am not going to say agile is the... Uh, nirvana of all processes. For instance, if you work at a large healthcare company or perhaps at some manufacturing company like Boeing, um, obviously Six Sigma or there are different types of processes that make a lot of sense because your customers need something like safety over you moving fast and breaking things. So um, this talk's designed a little bit more heavily for software companies, but um, it's just something to keep in mind because in Silicon Valley, we often think one size fits all um, on this sort of thing, and it definitely does not. Um, so a little bit about my background. Um, I've led design from product through marketing for both consumer and enterprise companies, both small and large from early stage startups to, um, quite, um, to larger enterprise companies, and been an agile coach for Fortune 500 companies. So this has kind of given me a very broad background of um, different states that companies can be in within their customer experience cycle, um, as well as the, there are processes that work really well when you're really big that are impossible to do when you're small. And there's processes that work really well when you're small that are impossible to do at scale. So it's just keeping this in mind. So I'm not, there's not one white, right way to do anything. So we're just going to explore some different ideas today. Um, and I really like having a dialogue uh, between, because design is really a dialogue between the customers and the designers. So I'd love to get feedback. So you're welcome to share feedback with me after this or in, during this. Um, you can email me, Chloe Future Design. You can tweet. Um, I really enjoy the feedback. Um, it's really helped me improve um, the way that I help share this information with people. So I really appreciate that. Normally, I think I can see people, but for some reason, I can't see you guys. I was going to ask you how many of you have already entered design into your um, agile experience process. Um, maybe you can give at least Andy an idea, heads up, if you've already are using um, agile and design in your delivery team. Just give a thumbs up, thumbs down. I don't know. They, um, they should be able to see, we have a chat room on the side that they should be able to access. Oh yeah. Um, you guys see that? Um, just write yes or no. Um, so, so what is the question? Uh, I'm just wondering how many people here are already entering Agile into their, um, combining both design and Agile into their delivery team process, right? Because some companies will definitely have great customer design, but keep their engineering teams totally separate from that process. Other companies have tried to like bring them together. So it's just sometimes useful to note because we get different, I get different questions. Yeah, they they've answered. Um, <laughs> they answered most of them. Most of them have experience. Are asking if lean counts, and some of yes. them say kind of. But okay, so I'll let you. I'm going to let you continue, Chloe, and I'm going to step out of the way. Okay, yeah, lean counts. Um, yeah, so that's actually another really confusing thing. When I'm going to refer to agile today, I'm really going to refer to being adaptable. Um, being adaptable, being responsive, being able to create change, um, and to rapidly make iterations. Lean UX is definitely a, a, a giant movement, and it's very confusing. Even in the Agile community, you will get people who will disagree um, whether those are the same or different or whatnot. Um, for the purposes today, let's just look at them as all part of the same umbrella, right? Because we're really trying to be able to learn quickly, get feedback, and iterate. 
So I think that's the, the, the biggest point. Um, so to really understand this talk, we need to kind of um, go in and um, one second, you guys, I have a thing on my screen that it won't go away. Um, yeah. We need to really understand why this matters, what it is, and kind of get some strategies. So we're going to kind of go um, pretty broad and then get kind of deep. So yeah, why does customer-centric design matter? You can use Agile to help you execute Agile for the development delivery team process to help you execute and build products at speed. But this doesn't mean you're going to build the right thing. It's why Agile alone is not enough to create innovation and meet your customers' needs. You need, to, you need to be agile with a customer-centric design approach to deliver value quickly and continuously to your customers to really build that trust and long-term relationship. So Amazon was listed as Fast Company's most innovative company of 2017. I think they're like number five on the list this year. Um, but anyway, in 2017, it was a pretty big year for Amazon. Um, Amazon Echo really took over. Um, they had a huge innovation in their robotics and their distribution spaces. Also, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Just Walk Out experience. I tried that out in Seattle. Um, you're basically watched nonstop by cameras from all over the room that could tell exactly when you remove something from a shelf and like put it in your bag. And then you just walk out through a turnstile that at that point um, uses like NFC with your mobile app to check you out. Um, pretty sweet experience. But um, how did they actually get to be called one of the most innovative companies? Um, part of that is because of Jeff Bezos' philosophy. Our job is to invent new options that nobody's ever thought of before and see if customers like them. Amazon is incredibly customer-centric focused. Uh, it's one of the most customer-centric focused companies out there. In fact, they've decided actually to make that their whole entire value prop for the company. So if you go to Amazon's about page, you will basically find that Amazon has decided to be Earth's most customer-centric company. That is their goal. Um, so it really is no surprise um, that they are one of the most innovative companies and um, continually create so much revenue. In this day and age, um, design, design like a few years ago, I'm sure, I don't know how many designers we have in here, but design's really had a, like a transition over the last few years where we've really moved into space now where companies didn't really understand that they needed to value design to the point where I think somewhere around like 89% this year of like companies surveyed by like Gartner um, would put design as one of their key, uh, like customer centricity, customer experience design is sort of one of their key differentiators in the marketplace. So design's really gone from being something that was almost like an afterthought or something to have for brand as something that's at the forefront. And um, design's also really in a space of transition. So we can no longer really decide the way forward. We must design the way forward. And uh, I mean something really specific with that. In the past, um, I think a lot of us are pretty familiar with a sort of classical design. If we think about something that's classically designed, you might want to think about something like a table. Um, we have specific table heights that we think are, in general, preferable for people to sit at overall. So there's maybe a persona of a person who needs to sit at a table with the generic height. And we can know, like there's an idea that you can create this design, you can really know, know it, you can be right. Um, there's a lot of trust in ourselves as designers um, in, in the opinion process for creating this design. Um, as companies kind of move and scale, we've switched over to more of the design thinking element, which is more with a lot of A-B testing, um, A-B testing obviously doesn't work at a small um, small startup, so it depends where you at, are at. Um, you have to have scale to do this. But I don't know. Let's test and find out. So it's basically starting to move away from being absolutely certain about your design decisions to realizing that there's a lot of variations. Um, you've got a lot of different type of customers. You don't completely know, and you need to figure out what's going to work. So this is sort of how you have to design the way forward. This is where we start to become more adaptable. Uh, we usually need to bring in an agile development process that basically allows us to ship things quickly, get actual feedback and data from the customers, the metrics. The metrics usually help inform our design segments 
Um, so there's a lot more um, in the numbers here, less um, on the personas. And then as we move towards the future, which is actually already here for some companies, which is either called computational design or generative design, depending on uh, who's, who's discussing it. But this is really the epitome of um, designing the way forward because it's we've, we're literally taking uh, the designer almost out of the process in a way. Um, because it's not about us. It's just realizing that I have no idea. Like, I don't know. The algorithm is going to create it. The algorithm is going to personalize it. And um, we're going to design the, we're going to basically design the algorithm that designs it. So if we want to kind of think about what the epitome of this would look like, I would uh, invite you to think of Alibaba. Um, Alibaba has done amazingly cool things with computational design. I think one of their coolest things is for Singles Day, which is like the biggest holiday in China. Um, they basically created something like 400 million different banner ads, um, as well as 60% of all the pages delivered were uh, AI generated, custom on the fly. Um, to help generate something like $25 billion in sales. And basically what they did um, is they used machine learning and an AI to just figure out what people were actually browsing and doing their behaviors and likes on Alibaba, and then created a massive like design library of backgrounds, imageries, potential messages, and had the AI basically create these pages and all the ads to be exactly personalized with the items that those customers have previously browsed um, to help create the conversion that they got that day. They also use their machine learning and AI to answer about 95% of all the help desk questions to help um, deal with that volume of transaction. So I would say that's the furthest along, some of, some of the further um, one of the companies that's further along on, on um, generative design, right? There's no designer that got to say, oh yeah, the, the ad doesn't look good with that like crazy background in that, that shoe and that message. It was really based on, we think the, ad, the AI could say, hey, this person's going to convert with this completely, what somebody might think of as an ugly background with this object in this message and deliver it. Um, so that really is where we're, the designer is starting to even um, disappear from the design process, you could say. So how fast uh, does your company really design and ship values to customers? If you can answer that. Um, does it take about a week from when you first go, okay, we're going to work on this feature to get it live, tested, go through different things? Does it take you, you know, four to eight weeks? Does it take you a couple of months? Um, you can uh, maybe answer in the side. Andy, I can't see the side, so maybe you can shout out what people say. But this is always also really interesting, and it's a non-judgmental space. Because, for instance, uh, I've given this talk at, like, really large banks. Um, there's a lot of regulatory requirements. They're pretty, uh, they're pretty on the further than 24. They're probably on the 48 weeks um, to ship something. Um, you can give this at an early stage startup, and they may be at one week or less. So. Um, really depends, but it's just to get a sense. Andy, do we have any answers? I can't. Yeah, it wasn't actually, we have some uh, two to four weeks is uh, what we see right now. But oh, I would just say, I would just encourage you to to keep going and let people kind of, you know, we'll, we'll keep this as a question for everybody to ask themselves. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I don't have that many more questions. Um, going on. Yeah. So actually one of the coolest, fastest, uh, customer experience design things that I, that's happened recently, um, a few years ago, uh, Locke Lemur tweeted in to, um, Elon Musk saying, Hey, all your chargers are full everywhere. And I can't park my Tesla. This is such a Silicon Valley question. Anyway, within one week, Tesla was able to make changes to both their mobile apps that do the charging and push the change to all the charging stations so that if somebody was to leave their car there beyond the certain amount of time, their car would then get charged. They would actually get charged a fee to help free up the charging station. So this is sort of like the epitome of um, being customer-centric and agile, to be able to take customer feedback 
and to be able to make changes and drive it into your product within a really fast amount of time and get it out and create customer satisfaction. So um, the biggest thing that I would say um, for the Q&A part is just to like think about anything I say that maybe even like you agree with, disagree with, irritates you, questions you have. Um, I'm not asking you to agree with anything that I necessarily say. Um, I do note from having given this talk that um, when somebody really has a question or disagrees about something, it usually brings up a really great discussion point. Um, you would... Even companies that we think of as having everything together from the outside, like if we look at them, I'm not going to give any of their names away, uh, we would think, oh my gosh, they have every last bit of their design thing together. Um, and then I've given talks at these companies, and actually I find that they're still struggling in one, in one area on the spectrum. So everyone is struggling in some way, that's all I'm going to say. Um, good to kind of just listen for what that is. So we're going to go really broad and really deep from... Um, to figure out like what is customer centric design and quickly bring it back into our agile development process and keep that mindset at the center. So it's going to go pretty fast. Um, so basically customer centric design is much more of a systems level of design. It uh, keeps our customer focused throughout all the different levels of the journey. I'm just going to define design for us so that we're on the same page. I usually define it as intentional problem solving and a process to achieve a purpose. And just some reminders, some guidelines for what we might want to think of as good design. Um, design is different for different contexts, culture, users, and goals. Um, you might want to keep the I don't know, let's find out, because we just talked about how design is really moving from I know and I can be right to I don't know, we're going to create an algorithm because we cannot be right. Um, and we got to focus on um, learnings. The other good reminder is that there is no universal rule. Um, Absolutely no universal right in design. Um, some things actually uh, convert better when they're ugly or from your maybe your personal point of view. So, um, or messy, or you can think culturally in America, we like a lot of white space. In Asia, they would think that the website was unfinished. And in China, they would wonder what was wrong because it was missing so much on the page. So we can't really think of any one universal rule of design. So I'm just going to toss that out there as well. So to give us a little bit of framework for thinking about design, I try to divide it into three different areas. Um, brand experience really helps us deliver on that brand promise. It is part of the design that builds trust. It builds repeat business. Um, the customer experience aspect of design really keeps the customer's needs at the center of all the touch points throughout the company that it interacts with. Uh, this is sort of the support aspect. This could be sales, business development, um, customer success. It does include the product. It includes sort of the whole entire customer journey. And then for this, for our purposes of this uh, talk, we're going to kind of limit user experience design to sort of like what is in the product or the software as a service or any individual uh, product. Obviously, all of these things overlap, just, um, just trying to throw different lenses on them. The reason I'm trying to throw different lenses on them is because to actually be customer centric, one of the, one of the challenges is user experience design, customer experience design, which is more of that service design systems level and brand experience actually all have competing interests. If you kind of step back for a second, um, for user experience design, this really works well with lean and agile where we're trying to, um, create a design, toss it out to the customer and get feedback and iterate quickly. Um, trying to figure out what the user's needs are, meet those business needs and make sure it's technologically feasible. Uh, this works really well for rapid iterations. When we think of customer experience design at that systems level and that leverages service design, this doesn't work quite as well at the whole rapid iteration thing. The reason why is because the perspective required to design at a systems level is different. Instead of looking at a single point of interaction, we have to look at the whole system and figure out what is the experience we want that system to create. And then we have to set up everything, design it to create that system. So it sort of has a competing um, competing need. And we'll see that as we continue through. And brand experience, which is identity design, is really that non-conceptual aspect where we can't really say it's any one thing, but we know it and can feel it um, when it's there. But the other thing, reason I'm bringing this up is because 
really great brand experience is uh, braced a lot on consistency. So consistency and trust. So it would be very confusing, for instance, for us to go to Starbucks everywhere in the world and have a different Starbucks logo, different colors. We wouldn't know if we were in the real Starbucks or a knockoff Starbucks. So brand experience is definitely something based on like continuity, consistency, which is sort of the opposite of that sort of Agilene UX iterative thing. So it's good to just realize that um, there are there are is some tension between these different aspects of design. So brand experience design delivers on that brand promise in all of the cut main customer touch points to really create trust and loyalty. This is this amazing mint frappuccino that I got at Starbucks. It tastes like a Girl Scout cookie in a drink. It is super awesome. So however you personally reacted to what I said, some people think that's gross, some people think that sounds good, um, is something that Starbucks can't control. So your brand experience is the furthest piece out in the design process um, where the company is not, the company can't influence how people perceive the brand, but they can't completely control it. It's really a combination that's made up by what the company puts out about itself and then sort of the collective consciousness about what, how we perceive it, how we talk about it, how we create those experiences for others. So the brand experience is the thing that the company um, has some control over, but not complete control. And for the next point, we're going to look at... Um, Virgin America, just to kind of understand what customer experience is. The reason I'm so sad they're gone, um, we can just have a moment of silence for Virgin. Okay, so uh, their brand voice was to live on um, be clever, provocative, and friendly. And I really think Virgin America really knocked it out of the park in bringing their brand promise into every level of their experience. So let's just take a customer journey um, on a Virgin um, on Virgin America. So yeah, we're thinking about uh, taking a flight. We're gonna go to Las Vegas. And if we can just look at this right here, this is sort of all aspects maybe of what we're gonna encounter in our um, Virgin America journey. And we can see that they, they created a pretty consistent brand experience. Um, so you can see that um, they wouldn't wanna like rapidly iterate and change say the color of the background of their area with the check-in boost to yellow suddenly their experience would be off. So that's why I'm putting and bringing this up because brand experience is definitely based on continuity and consistency, which is at, at opposite of sort of lean agile. And the reason why the brand experience is so important is because it takes an average of 12 um, positive brand experiences to overcome any negative experience. So I don't know how many people here have ever used Comcast. Um, but uh, Comcast has uh, a reputation for creating a really negative uh, customer experience at the end of your account. Like you want to cancel your Comcast account and turn in your box. And a lot of people have found that um, it's almost impossible. Comcast is not very friendly about the process to the point that people actually talked about how terrible the end of life last moment with Comcast is. So that created for Comcast to overcome that reputation of being, having a bad brand experience would take a lot of effort. So that's why brand experience is so important to be consistent and positive. Um, we'll just leave this in here for later. You can look at that. So we're going to now look at the customer experience piece, right? Which needs to put people's needs at the heart of everything throughout the whole entire process. Actually really understanding your customer experience journey helps you de-risk innovation because it helps you identify actually the areas of your company that are most valuable for you to put the design effort in. I'm sure that any designers on this call know that no matter if you're a small company or a giant enterprise company, no matter if you have like one designer on staff or like 500, there is no company that feels like they can design everything all the time as good as everybody wants to. I'm just putting that out there. So really uh, leveraging uh, customer journey maps to understand what is the most valuable thing to change and design for customers really helps you increase value and de-risk innovation. So let's go on our flight. Uh, Michelle would like to go on a flight with Virgin America to Las Vegas. Actually, she typically flies Virgin when she flies. Personally, 
for work, she typically flies United, but when she goes on uh, trips for fun, she really wants um, the flight to go well. She's frustrated from um, her typical work United experience. So she's pretty loyal to Virgin. So she wants to go to Vegas, but she also um, doesn't want to spend a ton of money. So she starts out on the Google homepage and kind of searches for flights for Las Vegas. She comes up with a few different options, and she ends up going landing on the Virgin website. Um, from there, she books her flight from San Francisco to Las Vegas. She goes through the whole process pretty quick. Uh, she gets a notification email, right, that her flight's been booked. She can get her boarding pass. Virgin had this sort of like print your own boarding pass thing. Um, they also have the boarding pass in their app. She gets an email. Um, she gets a calendar reminder. So this is all different parts of her experience. She takes a lift to go to the airport. She arrives at the airport and she actually checks in for the Virgin flight using her app, um, but needs to still check the bag at the drop the bag at the counter. She wanders around the airport. She ends up going to one of the shops at the airport to look for books to read on her flight. Um, she kind of sits in the lounge area, and then she eventually uh, boards at the gate. Michelle relaxes in her seat, and she ends up ordering some food from their in-flight options. She watches a movie on her uh, personal um, device. She doesn't use their in-flight entertainment option, uses the Wi-Fi the Bridge in America flight lands at her destination in Vegas. One of my fun things on this photo, if you guys can spot it, is Spotify. All the Virgin America airplanes had super clever, fun names. Anyway, so she lands at her destination in Vegas, and she deplanes, and she goes to pick up her luggage, and then she gets in her rental car, and she drives off. So right here, we've just kind of gone through her whole entire customer journey. And you'll notice that that customer journey included things that definitely included Virgin America in the process, but also included things that have nothing to do with Virgin America in the process. So the customer journey, when you're mapping that out, is really about the person, the human's point of view and the human's experience. It's not about the company's experience. Like you, you map in the company's experience, but you're actually mapping the person's human experience. So there are pieces that are outside of our control. But we also want to keep the customer as king at all points of our process. That's the reason why we're focused on the human experience and not the company's experience in creating these maps. And we need to be, oh, are we missing? We're actually maybe missing a slide here, but um, maybe it will come up in a moment. Sorry, you guys, one second. I prefer if, uh... okay. Uh, never mind. It's done for them. Anyway, so this is why it's so important for us to keep our, our human being, a human experience at the center of what we're doing. We really um, can figure out what are the human problems that are needing to be solved. And so if you remember in the beginning when I talked about different ways that we can look at creating those human experiences, we can create like behavioral personas. And when I say behavioral personas, that's like jobs to be done. That's like this person's trying to buy a plane ticket to go somewhere. That's a job to be done. It's not a persona based on like, Michelle made $140,000 a year and is like 29 years old and, you know, she's at the cusp of the millennial and whatever. And now you're going to imagine all these different things about her that aren't true. No, a uh, data-driven behavioral persona is literally just the facts around the behaviors that the person is trying to do. That's actually what's valuable. Um, then you can also look at the targeted data-driven segment. So that's like if we were a slightly larger company, have a lot of metrics, you might want to be based on that. Um, and if you're a large company that has a lot of scale, you actually might not be uh, even caring specifically about any one segment. You may be are focused on machine learning and um, your personalization efforts. Yeah, so this was just a quick overview to help us remember how these things relate. So for brand experience, we're building trust. That trust is based on continuity and consistency. Um, you definitely won't want to be while you might be agile in aspects of how of that brand experience, you're not going to be randomly, rapidly iterating that. Um, your customer experience piece is designed at a systems-wide level. So it's designed outside in. For instance, for us to design, we'll see in a moment, um, 
we can't, uh, we could iterate any of those moments that Michelle just had in her experience. Like we could iterate the app or we could iterate like her experience checking in at the counter. Um, but it's much harder to rapidly iterate the whole entire journey once you're at, once a company is established and built out. So it's just a good reminder. And then the UX is usually in the product. It's the user experience and interaction dr directly inside of the thing that, um, the product or thing that the person is working on. This is actually a lot harder than it sounds to do this well. Um, most companies um, are sort of inside out. Um, what do I mean by inside out? Most companies are business metrics driven, looking to say, hey, we need to increase growth X number or we need to make this certain number. That's a, what we need. That is not what the customers need. The customers do not care if you get 5% like uh, growth in this area, right? That is not a customer focus. So to really actually be customer centric, you have to flip the whole view. And that actually includes like finances and metrics to be um, outside in. So it's really focused on the human behavior and what those customers actually care about and need. Ironically, doing this flip actually helps drive growth and create uh, better financial outcomes because you're focused on solving customer problems and actually identifying new customer problems. So it's really uh, actually a positive, positive flip, but definitely not the easiest to do. So we're gonna kind of look a little bit at customer-centric design strategy. So one of the things to think about later on is just to think about if you actually do understand the needs of your customers, like the human need, um, also how your customers interact with your business. Um, and also, can you get your team aligned on the highest priority? And do you guys actually know what your brand promise is to make sure that you're delivering on that in, the, in your customer experience? So this is a fictional um, customer experience journey map based a little bit on our uh, Virgin America experience that we just all went through. Uh, I've added a few more things to this, but just to understand what this is, when you're looking at a customer experience map, you're basically trying to map out all of the things that the customer did to accomplish their goal. So in this point, it was from uh, booking the ticket to leaving the airport, so through her flight. And you usually want to also map out uh, the emotional aspect, the spectrum of like where the customer felt um, as they were going through each item. So here, this is totally fictional, as you can see, because I was trying to create emotional spectrum so you could just see variation. We can say that the booking experience was really awesome. It's at the high end. We can see that maybe getting the check into the flight at the ticket counter was like a low end of the experience. Part of looking at this is so that you can identify areas that relate to the company specifically or opportunities that could work for the company to change um, that are especially on the lower end of the spectrum of the customer experience so that you can improve them because those usually uh, may have the biggest financial outcome. So this is why it's really important to look for and prioritize those moments of truth of the customer experience because no matter what size your company is, you will always have to prioritize. You cannot design everything well. It's just, no matter how hard you try, there's going to be something where someone feels that they cut some corner. Um, and this could, as I said, I've talked to every type of company, even the ones that we think of as like the nirvana of design, and they will tell you they also have this experience. So if we look at this, um, this might be, you can see the top row is sort of our customer's emotion as they're going through different areas. and then. We can take a guess at like what might be the different business impacts of changing that. Um, so we can say, okay, in this one, maybe the customer is really unhappy in the planning process. Uh, the planning process is actually the business impact if the planning process doesn't go well for the customer is actually pretty high because that's where the customer would convert and purchase a ticket. So our priority to fix the customer's emotional needs at that stage is actually a really high priority. So this is sort of a very simplified way of trying to understand what we should care about and how we should prioritize things. This is something that is uh, really uh, interesting for us uh, to think about as a software company. And the reason why I'm just going to give you this, we look at this hamburger. This hamburger, if I told you we needed to deliver this hamburger, uh, one hamburger out every 10 seconds from the kitchen, 
you and all, everyone here on the phone would get super creative about setting up that process, knowing that we probably can't have like the cheese in a refrigerator in a different room, right? We would all get extremely organized and really clear that we have to set up everything precisely to actually deliver this hamburger out the door every 10 seconds. Well, in a software company, uh, we don't always see that. It's much harder for us to see that we actually have to set up our design teams, our design systems, our design language, our development process to do the same thing, really to be able to get something out the door fast and iterate on it. So that's where it talks about like the, the point of the customer experience being sort of the uh, systems level in. So this is called the service blueprint. We looked a little bit at it before, but what you can see is we kind of have to actually figure out when we're looking at like a systems level um, outcome, what experience we're trying to create and then work down from there because there's many different things that have to change and be put in place to make that happen. The reason I'm bringing this up is just so we have a familiarity with this, right? So this would mean, this is really obvious for something like an event, which is what I think the service blueprint is for. But like, if we want people to have a certain experience at our event, we, uh, we first chart out what experience we want that person to have. Then we actually put in place the, the ways for the attendees to interact, the people to be there to help them interact with. We have like the back end people, the people helping set up and create that process and environment for the people to interact with the entities to create that experience. So it's sort of, if you want to look at it, to actually design a customer experience on a systems level well, it's, the, uh, it's sort of the opposite almost of the, um, you can definitely iterate, I'm not saying you can't iterate this, you can definitely iterate this, but you have to look at it and be smart about how you iterate it because you're really setting up the system um, and it's going to span a lot of things, right? For versions to like randomly iterate their whole customer journey is definitely a lot of effort because there's a lot of money that goes into it. So it's a lot easier for us to iterate within the customer product development process. So for uh, Silicon Valley companies working a lot more on SaaS software, this is probably the easiest area to iterate, but it doesn't mean that you can't iterate it in other areas. So this would be the user experience piece. And this is looking at the system, the user, and the context of use. So we talked a little bit about figuring out what the system is. We can definitely see that if we do the customer journey. Definitely want to know who the user is. Um, we looked at the, you can either define it by sort of an individual persona all the way out through we're needing to define the user by their personalized needs. And then we need to know the context of the behavior that they're actually doing in that moment. So that's the context of use. And these are the most important um, keys to user experience design. For us to really do this well, we have to really look to figure out what's our, what's our feedback loop? What can we, um, how can we design something, test it, put it in front of a customer and get information back as fast as possible? And also we want to try to identify our feedback loops closest uh, to the context of use. So the reason I bring that up is because there's lots of different ways to do these feedback loops and we get really different information based on how close we are to the context of actual use. So this is just, you know, the basics that I think almost all of us hopefully are familiar with about building and having a hypothesis that are based on all of our hidden assumptions. Some of them will be ones that we've already stated. Um, we'll want to test and validate um, with actual perceivable behavioral data. So that could be watching somebody, do, it's sort of like the bird watching validation, it's the um, metrics we can get. So we get that observable behavioral data um, to get that feedback and then we can adjust our design, integrate those learnings, we'll have some new hypothesis, new assumptions kind of go through the cycle. So this is our feedback loop. And so when we, keep, we do hypothesis driven design, we hypothesize that doing, making some action for this specific customer type will achieve some attitude or behavioral change, which we can measure in this way. So we have a, we have a hypothesis. It's really clear. It's actually really good to, um, as a team, really state your hypothesis out, uh, out and make them outright. The reason why is because when you do that, especially on a team, you'll find that everybody has a different bias and way of seeing things. And that's so incredibly valuable because it helps us see holes in our own hypothesis even as we go in the door. 
um, which puts us in a better space to be in the, I don't know, let's find out. My could be wrong. It's actually freeing because um, as we move from, um, as we start to actually do this, and this is from um, the quotes from John Maida, but um, design is always contextual and our users always matter. So there's really no predictable known answer. What worked yesterday definitely may no longer work today. So what worked to help convert people in the last election is not going to work in the next election because Facebook will have changed aspects per se of how the platform works. So we always have to stay contextual and we actually always have to stay measuring actual results. Um, and the reason why it's really good as a team to sort of bring our hypothesis is so we can like kind of put our ideas over our ego um, and also just realize that we're most likely going to be wrong. I would say, depending on where you are in your um, design and company process, companies that A-B test all the time, uh, people kind of, as you A-B test, I'm not talking about once and once a week or once in a while, but if you're A-B testing nonstop, um, most people who do that go through this sort of humbling process of realizing almost everything they think is wrong. Um, because the majority of your A-B tests are, are going to, to um, you're going to learn something from it, but they're not going to go the way you thought. Uh, actually, at that point, you'll start saying, oh, I did, if, if, if you don't learn something in the A-B test, then that's when the A-B test has gone, gone wrong. But that's a really humbling process, which helps us make that shift towards thinking we should, we should use an algorithm to figure out what people want, because we actually realize we really don't know, especially at scale. Uh, so it's just really good for us to keep in mind that when we share as a team what our hypothesis is, we're going to get a lot of different ideas, but all of our ideas could be wrong. So there's no point in really fighting for my idea over your idea. We just need to get the best that we think as a team is the best idea and give it a go as fast as possible. So that's why I put bias for action here. Um, this is, I just put this in here because when uh, you say waterfall design, some people are unclear what this is. And I'm just going to point out this is not what I'm talking about today. Um, this is from Tom Shi, uh, this slide. So waterfall is less customer-centric for software. Waterfall is not a bad process for everything. So I'm just going to toss that out there because we tend to be black and white in Silicon Valley. And if you're trying to, for instance, be IKEA and create a million version of the same light in plastic, you definitely need a process more similar to this. Uh, but anyway, so if we can look at this waterfall method and you can kind of see some people are doing what they think is agile, but it's actually waterfall. So I'm just going to toss this out here. Look at it quickly. So if you're taking a lot of time to actually do design rounds, follow up meetings, write big spec docs, um, making the list of what should be built, having the engineering team build it, then test it for the first. Maybe you've tested some early designs before it was built, but then now you're testing it. And now you're like many weeks out and you're learning and iterating on it. This is waterfall. To really actually uh, not do waterfall and do agile or lean, you need a cross-functional team. And to be able to do that, um, that's sort of if we think about our hamburger, your company really needs to set it up so you've got everybody on the right team that you need to actually deliver something and ship quickly. Um, so... Forgive the little characters. I was just trying to find find some people to stand in for different different ideas here. But yeah, so if we have everybody we need on our team to actually create what we're trying to do, we'll be able to actually test it, ship it, uh, put it out there, get feedback really quickly. Um, it could be everything from a user researcher separate from UX. The UX person could be the user researcher, someone who had the DevOps experience to get it actually up and deployed. Um, QA, the QA could even be the product owner. So just understanding that we need all the right roles on the team working together to deliver something quickly. And so the reason why we looked at the waterfall is because if you look at this and you kind of look at it incorrectly, you might see waterfall, but we're actually not talking about waterfall here. So this would be uh, a quick uh, view of the agile um, design process for UX, right? And we might actually be able to go through this whole entire process from the beginning to the end in one week, maybe two. Um, and it's, there's, no, there's no starting stop, starting stop points. This is actually a very integrated process. There are a lot of ways to do this, um, which we're not going to get into, where you can uh, be focused on one thing. There's dual track agile just to 
give that to you in case you want to look that up afterwards. But anyway, the point in the beginning is we need to get some actual discovery and research. We need to actually know what the customer's needs are. Um, and we need to actually have some hypothesis and validate that hypothesis a little bit in our research. This could be a really fast validation, um, but this just helps us make sure we're running in the right spot. Uh, for the design process, that would be good to do rapid prototyping, to do some quick usability testing. Um, and this is not necessarily designing something, um, when I'm talking about agile design, I'm not talking about designing it in high fidelity with every beautiful aspect of the mock-up there. You actually learn completely different things. Um, toss it into development. The reason why you need to toss it up and get it out in front of people um, as soon as possible in a way that you can test it is because remember I pointed out that con closeness to context for the user matters. So the fastest you can have an idea, test it, validate it, create some development of it and put it in front of your actual users in the actual context that they use it in, um, which would be like an A-B test. Um, that's where the, um, the highest value arrives because you're testing it on somebody in their context of actual use. You still want to do all the other testing though. So I'm not going to say those aren't important. I, w I wish I could see all the Q and A's and stuff. I'm so sorry. I can't while I'm talking. Um, so yeah, if we're looking at the research, so we put this up because um, if you're a designer, you're pretty familiar with what this is. If you're not a designer, then you might less be familiar with what this is. But yeah, for research, this is just starting your, from a hypothesis that's based in something, based in some behavioral data, um, from quantitative surveys, from qualitative surveys. Um, I'm not very fond of focus groups, to be honest. Um, do usability testing. You can do a diary study. Um, definitely have some behavioral information, some metrics. Um, you can storyboard it out. But you need to start from somewhere and kind of outline, these are our hypothesis, this was the data, and this is everything we think could be right, everything we think could be wrong. Really want to prototype stuff at, um, to really be agile, you want to really prototype stuff with paper. The advantage with starting with paper, and I know that not everybody's into this, um, is because if you draw something out, and I mean paper with the designer and the developers involved in this paper prototypes and the testers, right? When you design something on paper, you'll get feedback from customers that are a totally different level of feedback. Because it's messy, no one's going to tell you, no one's going to be um, afraid to tell you that it doesn't make any sense at all, or it's a bad idea, or it doesn't meet their needs. There's nothing offensive. You put no effort into it from their perspective. So people are very honest and the filter gets very low. It's also a great time, too, to actually draw out and talk about this with the developers because a developer may look at the paper drawing and actually think you're asking them to build something like 20 times more complicated than reality. Or they could point out something. They're like, oh, if you just change these two things, we could actually develop this thing, you know, so much faster. But this one way you have this design here is going to take us a really long time to develop. And you might not actually care about um, the idea as much. So it's, it's really a good point to get the feedback, uh, make sure that you can build something quickly, make sure that uh, people understand it quickly. Switching over to like um, a wireframe and high fidelity level um, is also a really good thing to do as fast as possible. And you can do all this within a week or less. Um, really helps you get like the emotional impact for high, for high fidelity. You're really looking for emotional impact, especially when it's like, you know, in Figma or something where you can really see the interactions. Um, in wireframe, you're really looking to see if somebody actually uses the product the way you intended. So you're really going to get how people think to go through the flow. Um, this is also another great opportunity to make sure that you even test it with a developer who's actually on your development team, not just with your customers, so that you get the way that they're thinking about this process, um, especially around how they're going to code it. Um, the more collaborative you are with everyone on the, on the team, um, and the more that everyone feels they have an input in, you're not going to have um, buy-in issues. You're going to have, um, oh, also test everything by video. Um, that's I tell people this all the time and then they don't do it. Video all your user test because if somebody's not at your user test um, and especially if you're at a larger company and you need to prove that something is a terrible idea, nothing will sell it better than having a video of somebody trying your product and it not working out. If you don't have that video, it's going to be really hard if you have the problem of being at a company with the loudest voice in the room wins. So anyway, always video your testing. 
you know, when you test like this, you're able to iterate and get it out there a lot faster. Um, but the point is you really need to get out to working software as fast as possible. If you're really trying to do agile lean, um, uh, UX software development. The reason is what I stated earlier, you're actually getting people using the product in the right context. Um, and you're going to get the most accurate results because you're not creating a false environment for them to try it. You're going to get their real environment for them to try it. So it's really important to try to get to this um, working software piece as fast as possible. Uh, if we were to connect this agile development process, agile design sort of what development process that we talked about earlier a little bit to what the customer journey and that customer experience looks like. I'm not going to go really in depth because I want to make sure um, that we have some time for uh, questions. Um, but if we were to think back to going on our customer journey, we can actually map the moments of truth down into what we call epic. So this is if you have like a really large development team and you need to be able to triage like what you're going to work on. You might figure out those moments of truth. They all may end up being epics. And then they might actually break down further into your user story. So if this sort of helps you see how um, at scale your customer experience strategy can break down into um, your development process. And then the epics actually become customer moments of truth, if that, like moments that matter to change money for the customer. And your... Uh, um, your normal... Um, user stories become customer experience stories, like for really what you're trying to do for the customer. And if you can um, even integrate into your customer experience story, even like aspects of what, what you're trying to achieve with the brand um, at this level, that's really going to help um, you create the whole entire process, right? So if you're like, this is something we can experiment on in this area and it's not going to hurt our brand, or this is something that really needs to be in, on brand 100%, um, cause it's a, it's, it's something that's a key piece that really requires continuity versus an experimental thing. You can even put that in your user story. It just helps keep everyone on the team aware of this. Um, because not everybody usually is aware. They think brand is something that's the responsibility maybe of the marketing department versus like actually an engineer could be responsible for maintaining the brand. Um, Andy, what how, what time is it? Okay. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I think we can keep going for like 10 more minutes. It's getting late, but also we have comments like, is this being recorded? I love this content. Like people are, are really happy with the content. So so let's keep going for, for just a few minutes and then um, for like 10 minutes and then we can do a Q&A. Okay. Good, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, sorry for keeping you guys long. I actually cut a bunch of slides out too. Um, every time I do this talk, as I told you, it's version 2.04. Um, when I cut stuff out, I end up adding the slides, some of them back in or some of the stuff because people will email me afterwards <laughs> so, about the thing that I cut out. So it's, it's a really hard uh, balance and there's more than I could ever possibly fit into a single talk. But from talking to people, I found that most people found it valuable to get an overarching view and then we could always go deep into any area one-on-one. -on -one. You can message me on any of the networks and I'm always happy to help people. Um, yeah, so if we want to understand what this really looks like at the high performance level, the high performance level is really driven by mindset. And I kind of brought that up earlier. I brought it up a few times. We can think of it as that uh, the AI machine learning generational, I don't know, let's find out aspect. But when we can really be in that mindset that we really do not know what the customers need. We can just observe them and understand, try stuff. We know we're biased. So we're going to find out what we're, what's wrong. It's actually really freeing because we're just trying to find out what we don't know. We don't actually have to be right. It's actually to find out what we don't know as fast as possible. And when we have this mindset, we'll help create a whole entire environment that's going to support us and our whole company in this process, right? We'll be able to create a culture um, that's less like um, top down, I said that this should be blue, so it should be blue. And more like, well, we're seeing from the customers that they really like the green, right? Um, it really can bring it back to that. Um, it brings back to how we work as a team. It changes the process we use in the technology. So um, the key to actually doing this whole thing well is being able to just really iterate, we don't know, let's find out. But then being able to go, and as I said, have those videos, have those metrics, 
have that observable data, back it up and present it well. Um, otherwise, it, it will get hard. So I really love this quote if we want to get in that mindset. Um, I never lose, I either win or I learn from Nelson Mandela. So I'm just going to put us back. We don't have to know, we have to be able to learn. And that is the key to that whole entire process. I'm going to leave this in here for you guys to look at later, but growth mindset um, is an amazing way for us to actually um, to put ourselves and help put others into this state of, I don't know, let's find out. Um, it helps us stay in a more positive spot when what we try doesn't work out. And it really is the key to like creating high performance, right? We need to be able to deliver on our brand promise that we talked about. That brand promise we all have to be clear on. We need to be able to provide continuity with the brand. So um, I know Silicon Valley is into this, like, let's iterate our logo every two seconds thing. But um, if we really want to look at um, companies that have lasted a really long time, let's look at places companies like Coca-Cola, okay? They are not iterating their brand logo every a few moments. They need to stand for something because we're buying that based on trust, just like Starbucks. It would, it would lose trust for us in continuity to see a new Starbucks logo in every com country we visit. We actually wouldn't know if it was a Starbucks. So um, not everything uh, benefits from being iterated on um, in a rapid pace. And brand promise um, being able to stand for something matters, uh, especially when it's something that matters to your, uh, to your customers and something like that they can integrate into their personal identity of who they are. This is like the strongest level of brand. So we can think of apples, like, um, the whole, I'm a, I'm a Mac, not a PC thing. That really was like the epitome of identity brand marketing. Okay. So we need to be able to deliver on that brand promise across our customer journey. We need to know how to prioritize what we're working on around our customer journey. We need to have that understanding that we are at odds as we create a really good customer journey and then a little and, and good product user experience because one is created by figuring outside in, like what do we need to create for this customer from a holistic perspective? And another one is created from what are the interactions that are gonna work the most in this moment for this customer? So we need to sort of be able to bring all these things together and do them at speed. And the reason why speed matters um, is because in today's, uh, just in today's industry, speed is one of the, uh, biggest differentiating factors that helps um, companies get ahead in the marketplace. So it's like speed, distribution channels, uh, product market fit, um, but it's speed is a huge factor. Um, so being able to design um, well and ship things well and learn fast, we can just bring it down to how fast can we learn and drive those learnings back into the product is really what's going to make us a high performance company. So how fast can you really do this? Learn your wrong, change it, make something better and make the results you want so that you're designing um, the right thing and you're designing and, design and building them right. So that's, as I said, not possible uh, at every stage to do this at speed so fast. There's different ways of doing it at speed, I should say, at different stages, right? So this requires a lot of things to be in place that maybe are beyond what you as a individual at the co contributor or uh, manager at the company can control yourself, but you can advocate for if it's not there. Um, you really need the technology to ship quickly. Um, when I say technology to ship quickly, I mean, that is like, you need the infrastructure. Um, you need to be able to, uh, if, if it takes forever for uh, stuff to be developed, if the code is really old, if there's a lot of legacy, obviously this is going to be really hard to do. You really need a really strong design patterns um, and pattern libraries. Um, the best level is sort of the level I think that Airbnb is at where they're able to actually map their design system, their design pattern libraries directly with the design language and the code. That's like a very high uh, level of design systems. Um, the collaboration process, having enough collaboration, but not over collaboration. So this is like a, when I say collaboration, I'm thinking of like, you know, just enough people to get the job done. Um, I'm not thinking of what happens sometimes at really huge companies where like 40 people might have to collaborate to make a decision. That's, that's over collaboration. So you need to have enough collaboration and you need to have high quality code. Um, 
obviously tester development is like very rare. So I just put that out there because it actually does help speed up the process. Yeah, having continuous deployment, having A-B testing, um, having all this in place. So it's like there's things that help as a designer, help you achieve this at a software company that are way outside of your uh, individual capacity as a designer. Designer's control, right? Obviously, how you guys set up your sketch files and whatever you use for prototyping and having your design language systems, that's stuff that's in control usually of the design team. Um, whether the design, everyone on the design team can have access to something like usertesting.com to be able to user test anything at any time early in the process um, can help influence uh, the success of the design org. So there's things that you're definitely in control of and there's things that you need as a company. So I'm going to toss this, toss this up there because we really can't underestimate a company being set up for rapid iteration. So Facebook for a long time had their motto is move fast and break things, which I think we're all familiar with. Um, several years ago, I don't know, maybe like four years ago or something, um, they updated that motto slightly. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg was giving a talk and he's like, yeah, so it's move fast and break things with infrastructure. Because if you do not have the infrastructure in place for everybody to be able to test, design, and iterate as fast as possible, you can't learn fast. And especially at something like Facebook, where they're designing for billions at scale, um, they really need that because they really do not always know what's going to work. They can just find out. Um, so, yeah, we can take the leap and put this into action for ourselves. I think the biggest takeaway is I'm hoping that you kind of remember that even though brand experience, customer experience, user experience, visual design, I mean, they're all part of the same. They're all just lenses of the ways to look at design. Um, but we just have to, if we at least have the appreciation that they have competing interests, right? Like the brand wants consistency. The UX team wants to iterate fast. The customer experience team needs to make sure that they're creating something cohesive from outside in. Um, like outside is in our customers need this. Let's set up their journey. Um, it helps us a little bit negotiate and understand where the friction's coming uh, from within a company. Um, and just also, if we can remember our customers and identify our feedback loop, um, we'll be all set. Sorry, you guys, this has been really long for you. Um, so I think I'll just jump over to, um, to Q&A because I know it's been quite long. Sorry, I had to unmute.